Hey, what's up everybody? We want to welcome you to another episode of the Dreamers Pro Daily Recap, where we give you a recap of all of the hot topics that we covered that day. You can catch them in their long format and also catch it fully streaming for free on Apple Podcasts. Uh, today, it seems like LeBron has been having a bad, a bad go over the last few weeks. Now, what's interesting is the following. I don't think we've produced this much LeBron content in this with this succession uh, probably ever. Now, why is that? Well, LeBron has been giving us a lot of things to talk about, you know, with the Balco situation with Kevin Garnett and then some other stories uh, pertaining to him. And then now with the we're done with the 90s and they just keep giving us more things to talk about. Uh, so we're going to talk about it now. Some people will say, why, why are you talking about so many, bro? Because <laughs> it's my channel, bro. It's our channel. We can talk about whatever the hell we want to talk about. I guarantee you wouldn't be asking me that question if I was up here, if I was up here twerking it up all over the place and knocking over drinks and spilling. I mean, just 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 basically acting a damn fool all over the screen. Y'all would be like, yeah, keep it up. Let me go ahead and get him some honey so he can keep gyrating for us. But all of a sudden, y'all going to keep asking me these questions. So, so maybe we'll stop. Yeah, I think maybe we'll stop tomorrow. Or maybe, or maybe not. Maybe not. But you guys will be here to, for sure to see. So what happens? This morning I was doing some research. And I came across an article from fadeawayworld.net. Shaquille O'Neal says players don't fear LeBron James like they did Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. And I was like, bro, I just started laughing. I'm like, I'm like, it, it, it never, it, it never, ever ends, man. It must be really tough being a LeBron, a LeBron fan these days. So let me get into what this article says here. In a segment on the big podcast, Shaquille O'Neal served up his latest hot take regarding LeBron James and his place among the all-time greats. Speaking specifically on the fear factor, Shaq explained that LeBron doesn't invoke the same kind of dread as other superstars did when it was time to play against them. I've heard players say, including myself, I feared Michael Jordan. I've heard players in Mario Chalmers' generation say they feared Kobe, said O'Neal. I never really heard any player say they fear LeBron James. Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant were notorious for their killer approach to the game, which often involved a ruthless ruthless attack at the competition. Unlike LeBron's, LeBron, those guys were always out for blood and did not hesitate to push aside anyone in their way. If you look at LeBron, his desire to please everyone and become friends with uh with even his greatest basketball foes has eliminated the fear factor uh for his own career and it has changed the way the uh that opponents view uh, going against him of course Shaquille O'Neal is not the only to notice this last year Gilbert Arenas argued the same point as he explained why LeBron James and Nikola Jokic are different kinds of competitors than Jordan Kobe and Iverson former NFL champ uh, James Jones also argued that Dylan Brooks challenging LeBron in 2023 is the proof that players are not scared of him uh, at all. So you heard what this article had uh, to say there. What are my thoughts? I think Shaq is saying what everyone already knew. The only people that don't know this are maybe these new LeBron. Everybody knows this. This is Shaq ain't breaking no news here. He is not breaking up. This has been the, the MO since 2006, B. This is what players and fans always felt. They've always felt this way. Everyone knew that LeBron was an immensely talented player, but they knew that he didn't have his, that, that kind of like dog in him that players like Jordan and Kobe and others have. It's one of the reasons you heard Carmelo Anthony say, uh, he was like, he was seeing dudes trying to punk LeBron. And he's like, I'm going to come to his defense. Here's the irony. You know, LeBron is actually bigger than Carmelo Anthony. Do y'all know that? LeBron is actually a bigger person than Carmelo Anthony. But Carmelo Anthony was the one coming for coming to LeBron's defense. Why? Because Jordan and those guys, man, you couldn't play with them. They'll fight you. They will fight you. I heard Kenyon Martin, who was an enforcer to some extent, when he was on the Breakfast Club and he was talking about playing against Kobe Bryant and saying he's the best player he's ever played against. And he's like, don't get it twisted. Kobe will fight you. Like Kobe would fight. Kobe was nasty on the court to his opponents. And that's the way it should be. Do you know why? Because we're in competition. We're in competition. We're not out here trying to be friends. We're not out here buddy-buddying it up. 
I'm here to embarrass you. And it's one of the reasons you saw Kobe going at LeBron the way that he did. If you look at that last All-Star game, I think, yeah, one of the last All-Star games when they played where Kobe was picking LeBron up full court in that fourth quarter, Kobe was talking all kind of crazy, you know what, to LeBron. It wasn't the first time because he knew LeBron would flinch. Kobe knew if he looked at LeBron and LeBron looked back at him, he would flinch. And that's what it has. It has nothing to do about with your ability to fight. It has everything to do with your intensity as a player that these guys are not going to get in your head. You couldn't get in Kobe's head. You couldn't get in Jordan's head. But you can get in LeBron's head. If you try to trash talk Kobe or trash talk Jordan, it would actually rile them up. If you trash talk LeBron, it could rattle him. That's the reason why. Go back and look at the NBA Finals in 2011. I don't know if some of you guys ever saw. Go back and look at that series. I saw every game. The level of trash that Sean Marion and these dudes were talking to LeBron was incredible. They were disrespecting him so much in that series. Go back and look at the video. The stuff they were saying to LeBron. Go look back at those videos. The disrespect because they don't fear him. And to me, I don't think Shaq is taking a diss. I think what Shaq is doing is saying what we all already knew. Shaq is just saying what we knew. Now, obviously, <clears throat> some LeBron fans are going to take exception to that, and I understand. But here, here's the problem. The big media has really done a bad job with its curation of LeBron's story. They have really sold you guys a bag, a bag of lemons. They've made LeBron out to be this thing that he's not. He's the great. He's not. He's great in certain aspects. I was looking at some footage yesterday of the 2017-2018 uh, year when LeBron, some people are saying that's his best year as an NBA player. It was incredible. Bro, I was looking at Jordan 1995-1996 season. You couldn't even compare the two. You, you, you're watching these two players and you're like, bro, this is not close. Like, it's not even close. If you just watch it with your naked eye, nobody would watch that and say, oh, man, I think these guys are this and this really not. The eye test alone should tell you who the superior player was. So LeBron fans are going to feel a type of way, but I'm actually enjoying this. I'm enjoying producing this content. Um, a lot of people want to hear it. Obviously, a lot of people don't want to hear it. They're going to continue to come here and cry about it. Uh, and we and we welcome it. You know, if you guys want to if you guys want to torture yourselves by watching something you clearly don't enjoy then um so be it if we're going to lose some subscribers in the process so be it we'll, pro we'll probably gain others that means you were never really supporting the channel so it is what it is Shaq said what everybody already knew uh, i don't think he's breaking any news here we all knew this already As you guys know, some of these people are out here hollering and shaking and, 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 and gyrating over the fact, oh, LeBron hit 40,000 points. No, no, no. It was, oh, LeBron passed Kareem. He the GOAT. He the GOAT. He the GOAT. He the greatest scorer of all time. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yo, is LeBron a scorer? Yes. But the greatest? Hell no. Nah. I can name you some offensive players right now that I believe are better scorers than LeBron. Some people say who? I'm going to go with Allen Iverson. I'm, AI averaged 33 in the season before, back when teams were averaging like 102, 103 points per game. I'm going to go with AI. Obviously, I'm going to go with Kobe. Obviously, I'm going to go with Jordan. Obviously, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with James Harden. In terms of just scoring, obviously, I'm going to go with T-Mac, with dudes that can actually score the ball. Uh, scoring, obviously, I'm going to go with Kevin Durant. These are, these are guys that can score the hell out of the basketball. But the minute LeBron became the all-time leading scorer, people like Shannon Sharp and others. By the way, did y'all see Shannon Sharp and Kendrick Perkins fighting for the affection of LeBron James on TV the other day on ESPN? For these dudes were fighting. I, I, I love them first. No, I love them first. You don't love them more than me. I love them. Like, you ever seen? It was like Brandy and, and Monica. The boys, the boys, mine. LeBron is mine. Like it was crazy. Like, yo, bro, what's going on here? Why are we fighting over the love? Why y'all fighting over this dude? Like, anyway, that's that's the type of, that's that's where we are right now. But anyway, ever since he reached that record, people tried to say, oh, he's the greatest scorer ever. And I'm like, yo, y'all got to be crazy. You're talking about a cumulative amount. And yes, he averages 27.7. But trust me, LeBron is not one of the best scorers of all time. 
He's played for a very long time, but no one would accuse him of that. It's one of the reasons LeBron only has one 60-point game in his career. One 60-point game. So what happened? This morning, I was doing some research, and I was trying to understand how many games did it take LeBron James to, excuse me, how many games did it take LeBron and Michael Jordan and these guys to reach 30,000 points? And as I was doing the research, I was actually shocked to see that it actually took MJ way less games to actually hit 30,000. So according to this article from fadeawayworld.net, let me read you the guys and how many games it took them to reach 30,000 career points. Dirk Nowitzki, it took him 1,377 games. Kobe Bryant, it took him 1,180 games. Le, uh, Karl Malone, it took him 1,152 games. LeBron James, it took him 1,107 games. And Michael Jordan, it took him 960 games. So Jordan hit that number in what? Two and a half fewer seasons? Now, how is that possible if LeBron is the greatest scorer of all time? How is it possible? You say, well, Jordan's a chuck. Yeah, but all of his chucking, he still shot 49% from the field. And all of his buckets actually translated into championships. That's the first part. Here's the kicker in all of this. Here's the final shot of evidence to prove that Jordan was in a totally different universe. And actually, Jordan is the true king of scoring. If it's not him as well, or Kareem. Do you know that LeBron was drafted into the NBA at the age of, I believe, 18 years old? Do you know how old Jordan was when he was drafted into the NBA? Jordan, Jordan was 21 years old. So LeBron basically had a three-year head start. Three-year, or rather, he had three more seasons in his favor. And Jordan still reached the 30,000-point mark faster. Much faster. So how is LeBron the king of scoring all time? How? Do you know... That Kobe Bryant has more 40-point games than LeBron James and Stephen Curry combined. Do you know this? And do you know that Jordan has more 40-point games than Kobe? <laughs> Let me repeat it once more. Kobe has more 40-point games than Stephen Curry and LeBron combined. And Jordan had more 40-point games than Kobe. You know Kobe scored 40 against every single team in the NBA. Y'all know that, right? Kobe has scored 40, at least 40, against every single team in the NBA. Are you aware of that? And Jordan was a better scorer than him. I feel like things like this, things like this are said for two reasons. Number one, either you never saw Jordan play. Or number two, you're saying the things that you say to promote a narrative, but nobody believes it. Nobody. We're not talking about TikTokers and these people running around here hollering and screaming. We're not talking about them. Nobody believes this. So whenever people try to say LeBron is all time lead, y'all making it seem like he's the greatest scorer ever. He's not. He's just a dude that has the most cumulative points. But when it comes to getting buckets... Let me repeat the players I would take ahead of LeBron. I would take AI. I would definitely take uh, Kobe Bryant. I would take Michael Jordan. I would take a prime James Harden. I would take Kevin Durant. It's just that Kevin Durant doesn't want to be over, like, overly selfish. I would take all of these dudes. Because those dudes score effortlessly. And they have more moves. So they're harder to defend. By and large, for a defense to key in against them is harder. Now, LeBron can score a lot in this NBA because they're no, really, they're no real big men in the NBA anymore. They're no big men. So the lane is wide open. But go look at some of the footage of Kobe and those guys scoring on double teams with very poor spacing. Go look at MJ. 
Go look at MJ. Go look at James Harden. Go look at Tracy McGrady. Go look at Allen Iverson, who was six foot, 165 pounds, averaging 33 points in a season. And that's the year Kobe beat him. He would have won the scoring championship that year had Kobe not averaged 35 and a half. And Kobe had a six foot, six inch advantage over him. So to me, man, I think uh, this is a great time in sports media. All the lies and all of this stuff is being exposed. Y'all found a way to talk about it. We're done about it. We're done with the 90s. We're still talking about that Balco stuff. We ain't running away from it. Uh, and we're just going to keep we, we're just going to keep doing it uh, to you dudes until you finally submit. You know, until y'all finally tap out and say, yo, we had enough. But y'all are not going to have enough. Y'all going to come to the channel asking me this dumbass question every single day. Why you produce so many LeBron videos? Why don't you like LeBron videos? Why you keep coming here asking me these questions? You got people that are subscribed asking me these questions. How you look? You're a subscriber and you're asking me these questions. I would like your channel if you if you talked about something else. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not making content just for you individually. I'm not. One of the biggest myths that's being that's, that has been propagated throughout the NBA for over the last 10 years at least is that who did Michael Jordan face in the NBA finals? Who did he face? And then let's look at the talent that LeBron James has faced. LeBron has faced more players. It's one of the things that's driving this. We are done with the nineties. They're trying to say who was the competition? Who were the players, the, the, the crop of players that these guys were going up against. And they try to use it as something to they try to use it as something to hold against Jordan but one of them was like who did Jordan face in the finals who did Jordan face in the finals this is the one thing these people love running to who did Jordan face in the finals who did Jordan face in the finals and today I said to myself I said you know what I'm gonna spend some time researching this information because I'd researched it in the past I just don't know where the notes are we've done 3,000 shows so I don't know where the notes are and I was like okay I need to research it again to burst these people's bubble because the, the the lies need to stop. And listen, I think that we are amongst some of the platforms out here that are trying to that are trying to put a, you know put a correction in the system. There's been a lot of twerking, there's been a lot of gyrating, there's been a lot of slapping each other with honey all over the place. And we got to come up in here and we got to give our point of view too. There's been a lot of capping, you know, a lot of capping. There's been a lot of propaganda. I've noticed now whenever we produce some of these shows, all of a sudden. These weird ass accounts, these weird names keep posting the same kind of copied and paste stuff from Bleacher Report and The Athletic talking about the time. And I'm like, LeBron got bots working for him now? You got bots working for you? It's gone to this extent? So we, we, we got to put this information out. Obviously, it's going to offend some people. Obviously, I don't care because we're going to we're gonna keep producing it. Okay, let me get into this, 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 this information here. So LeBron fans love to say this. Who did Jordan face? Who did Jordan face? I think the better question you guys should be asking yourselves is, who did LeBron have? Y'all keep asking, who did Jordan face? The question you need to ask yourselves is, who did LeBron James have? We're going to get to that a little bit later. Let's get into it here. Let's look at the players that Michael Jordan is facing in the NBA Finals. <clears throat> They're the top 75 players. So these are these guys are considered to be the best players to ever play the sport. Let's see how many times or uh, how many different players Jordan has faced in the finals that were top 75 guys. Give you some names. Magic Johnson, James Worthy, uh, uh, Clyde Drexler, Charles Barkley, Gary Payton, Carl Malone, John Stockton. Those are seven names. Let's look at the players that LeBron has faced in the finals that are top 75 guys. Stephen Curry, Kevin Durant, Tim Duncan, Kawhi Leonard, Dirk Nowitzki, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden. That's seven players. Jordan faced seven top 75 guys. LeBron has faced 77 top 75 guys. So why is it whenever we have this conversation, you guys try to make it seem like as if LeBron was facing Thanos and Dark Side and all of these guys in the finals and Michael Jordan was going up against Super Mario and Sonic in the finals. You guys make it seem as if the the talent pool that Jordan played against was so low, but the talent pool that LeBron played against was so great 
But here we are, we're looking at some of the top 75 guys, and I'm showing you that in terms of the occurrences in which they face these caliber players was actually the same. Now, here's, here's actually where it gets worse. When you now consider the amount of help that LeBron has had throughout the course of his career in comparison to the amount of help that Michael Jordan has had, you realize once again why this debate is absolutely laughable. Some people, some people feel a type of way. I'm going to say it again. The Michael Jordan, LeBron James debate is a joke of a debate. You're bringing a player that is far more superior and you're comparing him to a player that's not on the same level and you guys are trying to make it add up and it's not adding up. So they face the same level of competition. Now let's look at the, 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 the players that Michael Jordan played with throughout those finals appearances to win those six championships in which he never lost and in which he never went to a game seven. Jordan played with Horace Grant, who was a one-time All-Star, Dennis Rodman, who was a two-time All-Star, and Scottie Pippen, who was a, a, a seven-time All-Star. Folks, those that's a combined amount of All-Star appearances of 10. That is a representation of the talent pool that Michael Jordan played with. Let's look at some of the players that LeBron has played with throughout the course of his career. Russell Westbrook, who some of you clowns were twerking it up all over the place when y'all thought the Lakers were going to win a championship that year. Anthony Davis, Carmelo Anthony, Rajon Rondo, Mo Williams, who was an all-star, Adrunas Ilgowskis, who was also an all-star, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, Ray Allen, Derek Rose, Kyrie Irvin, Kevin Love, Dwight Howard, who was probably one of the main reasons the Lakers were even able to beat the Denver Nuggets in the Orlando bubble because of the tandem of Dwight Howard and Anthony Davis. Those are the amount of players that he's played with for a combined total all-star appearances of about 106 to Jordan's 10. Here's some other information for the people that may think this is close. Do you know that Michael Jordan, when he played in the playoffs with at least one all-star, do you know Jordan has only lost one series? Here, let me repeat it once more. Do you know that when Michael Jordan throughout the course of his career has only lost one playoff series? When he had at least one all-star. Do you know how many LeBron and Kobe have? When they have all-stars. How many series they've lost. It got to be like around six right now. That's LeBron and Kobe combined. But you guys want to make it seem like it's close. Now some people will be saying. This guy's being disingenuous. Do you know why he's being disingenuous? Charles is a coward. Some people probably be calling me a bastard. He's a MFer. How dare you mention Carmelo Anthony? He was old. And then say LeBron James had him. Do you know when Dennis Rodman joined the, 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 the Bulls? He signed with them at the age of 34, 35. Do you know when he won the last championship in 1998? Do you know how old Dennis Rodman was? 37 going on 38. One year younger than LeBron right now. One year younger. Was Dennis Rodman not old? Well, of course he was. So why are you using that argument? Listen, folks. Listen. All the media does is lie when it comes to this debate. The only reason they say it is to generate money. They need somebody to compare to Jordan to argue to generate income. They know in their damn minds is not true. They know it. And I think that what is happening is something that they didn't anticipate. What they didn't anticipate is the advent of independent media. <clears throat> you see, big media, these guys can be controlled. You can tell them what to say and what not to say. 
Then you have some guys that are coming into the independent space, but they're still kind of corporate guys. They don't come in really, really independent. They're coming in independent, but they have a lot of ties to corporations, to a lot of connections and all of that. And they're still kind of promoting that same nonsense that's being promoted on television. But then you have the independent sector where guys like myself and so many others who have a totally different view from these guys. And what is happening is on an individual level, we can't really compete with them in views, although some guys can, some big guys can. But in aggregate, we absolutely can. I don't know the daily amount of views that independent creators get every day producing basketball content, but I'm sure it's a lot. I'm sure it's a lot. I'm sure it's a lot because we here get between what, three to four million views a month. And this is just us. We're not even at like 500,000 500, subs. So when you count all of those other guys, you're probably looking at what, 15 to 20 million views a month of people that have totally different viewpoints than a lot of this stuff that these people are saying. So whether or not they want to ignore independent media, and act like they're not real, and it doesn't really matter because it doesn't, it, what, who determines what's good is, and what's not good is not other journalists and other basketball guys. It's the fans. It's the view in public. The public get to say you're good, not you. The public are the ones that ultimately decide if the product is good, not you. And you can't gatekeep that. They try, but it doesn't work. So what's happening is you have so many, and, and Jason Whitlock pointed this out on his show with he's talking about Scap Attack and others. That's what's happening. So we're providing an alternative view and a lot of it is beginning to stick. And I think this is what they didn't anticipate. Because if you snuff out all the independent creators, then all you have is these dudes twerking it up all over the place every day. So to me, I think it's fantastic. I think it's a fantastic dichotomy that exists within the system. And I think it's something that's here to stay, to be totally honest with you. I think it's something that's here to stay and everybody's just going to have to find a way to, to navigate this new world. It's a brave new world. Let's get into this topic here. Now, this is a very interesting one, right? As you guys know, uh, JX My High Roller is probably the biggest. I could be wrong, but I'm going to go out on a limb. If he's not the biggest, he must be in the top three or top five uh, independent basketball content creators on YouTube. Uh, the gentleman has been on YouTube, I think, since 2007 or eight or something like that. And he has been putting out excellent work for literally well over a decade now. This guy, I mean, when you look at his content, uh, he has really well thought out, well put, to, well put together shows. They're all productions, they're all mini movies, and we all know who he is, right? He He's put out a lot of fantastic uh, work over the years. And uh, shout out to him and his channel and his team or whatever and what they're doing out there. Um, but as you guys know, there's been this conversation that's been taking place around the NBA community over the last two and a half, three weeks, I'll say two weeks, uh, which is centered on, you know, this thing of we're done with the 90s. And I personally think that is a, it was a diversion tactic uh, to get us to stop talking about the LeBron James uh, Balco situation that Kevin Garnett put out there. They wanted it to shift the conversation. <clears throat> and they did so to a certain uh, extent where essentially you had people on TikTok and others putting together these low light reels of MJ and various players from his era. And then it got to one point where just when you thought these guys couldn't get any lower, they went even now to the bedrock where they now came out and started saying Michael Jordan couldn't even go left. Or they said Michael Jordan, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't even have a left hand. And it was at that point I realized we are slowly entering into the twilight zone. So uh, JX Mahi Roller put out this show yesterday, I believe is at about half a million views in 12 hours. Uh, and a lot of people have watched it. A lot of people have reacted to it. It's about a 25 minute show. So what happened? Um, people started messaging me on Instagram. Uh, hey, did you see this video? Did you see what uh, J J J JX My High Roller did? Are you going to do a video about it? Then they started leaving comments on the channel. You're going to do a video about it. And then someone, one of our viewers left this long message, uh, excuse me, an email, you know, just basically explaining why he or basically trying to prompt me to go ahead and put a show out reacting to what he had to say so i said to myself last night i said you know what okay let me sit down and start to go through this show because 
it's a very long show and you got to watch it you got to come up with notes because you have to have points that you want to refute i don't use notes when i generally do shows i used to do in the past but it took me so much time to prep but this one i had to put out i had to kind of you know formulate my notes so i understood the particular points i was going to be responding to so i went through uh jx my high rollers show uh and i and i sat back and i watched every point uh that he had to made it make and i came up with my own and basically i'm i want to sit down today and refute almost everything that he said and tell him why he was 100 percent wrong respectfully uh and why i disagreed with every single thing that he said for the most part uh in his show so really that's what i want to focus in on today so let me get into it here he said a lot of things uh he said a lot of things and i want to refute some of the points that he said um he basically believes that according to what he said and i could be wrong but based on what he said he basically believes that the game of basketball uh has evolved over time but i don't think that i don't think in the way that he means it what do i mean by that instead of saying that the game has evolved what he should have said is the game has changed um and that's totally different because evolve gives off the connotation of it's getting better it's evolving it's improving when in reality the game is changing but i don't see how it's getting better and in my personal view and the view of many uh the game is not getting better he said that the talent pool overall minus the players at the top of the league uh is vastly improved vastly better uh and he supported that idea with basically three-point shooting percentage the way players dribble free throw shooting percentage and fouling now i want to systematically break down every point that he made and basically explain why i personally believe that uh he is 100 wrong and i'm going to explain to you why i believe he's wrong a little bit later in today's show he said that three-point shooting has vastly improved folks the fact that the matter is it has not vastly improved here are the numbers over the decades when we're talking about three-point shooting in the 80s the league average was 28.9 in the 90s it was 34.7 you're like okay that's an improvement it's a real improvement 36 percent in the 2000s it was 35.6 in the 2010s it was 35.6 in the 2020s is 36.1 going from 35.6 excuse me uh 35.6 to 36.1 it's not a vast improvement it's not at least not the way that he's couching uh, his statements a two-point percentage increase over 30 years is not a vast improvement in shooting it's almost negligible at two percent you see i personally believe that the major flaw in his argument uh is rooted in the premise he believes that players today are so good because of a lack of defense i say that the reason players today are so good is because there is no defense essentially what i'm saying is if you inject defense back into the game the players that you believe are more skilled or more advanced or bigger stronger faster faster etc etc you would see a sharp decline uh in their production in my personal in my personal view if players truly were better what he should have said is players today are so good regardless of the presence of defense that's when you can say wholeheartedly that players are good but you can't say players today are so good and also say there's a lack of defense and then attribute it to the fact that players are getting better. There's less resistance. That's just the fact of the matter and it's a metaphor of life. <laughs> Whatever you're trying to do, if there's more resistance, it's going to be harder. Period. 
It's just the fact of the matter. Another point he brought up in his show was that players in the past, they were the NBA was essentially drafting players in the past that were big bodies that could basically go out there uh, and co and commit uh, essentially a lot of fouls. But what I personally believe uh, he was discounting was the effect that those big bodies and those players that were out there to essentially foul players uh, was having on the games of offensive players. Now, if you don't believe that physicality plays or physicality or the lack thereof plays a significant role in a player's ability to number one, execute upon their skill and number two, produce, then you are totally lost and you don't need to even be a part of this conversation to begin with. If you don't believe what I'm saying is true, what we want to do is support our particular points with concrete evidence. What I want to do is we want to play an audio of Kevin Garnett having a conversation with NBA commissioner Adam Silver where Adam Silver himself, this is the commissioner of the National Basketball Association, essentially saying that, listen, the reason that we opted to uh, decrease the level of physicality in the game was because it was impeding the ability of so-called skilled players to go out there and produce. For those of you who may not believe me, want to play exactly what Kevin Garnett and Adam Silver spoke about as it pertains to this particular topic, and then want to come back and continue on the show. Take a listen to what they had to say here. Is the high scoring working? Is speeding the game up? Um, I asked this with a follow-up because I want to know, will there ever be a time in our lives where the hand check comes back? Is that is that going? Is this kind of the, the wave in which we're going now? I'll answer it coming from the fan in me, which is, and maybe data comes into play here because I can look at television ratings yeah. and other measures of yeah. interest. Yeah. There was a point, I believe, you know, probably in around the late 90s when the game became too physical. Mm. And I think we lost some of for the- For our viewers, you mean? Yeah, and I think for our fans, from the aesthetic enjoyment of the game, where it de-emphasized particular skill a player had mm. and maybe weighted too heavily um, physicality where mm. a big strong player could come in and prevent a incredibly skilled player from doing those kinds of things. Mm. I think of, not that he's a small guy, but a smaller player like Steph Curry can do on the floor. I think that when you think of some of his ability to shoot, his ability to move mm. through the paint that if guys could just bang him and knock him to the ground, as that was once the case in the league, right. I don't think that would be a better brand of basketball. Mm. I also think we have to find the right balance, because I know when I sit in the stands or talk to friends sometime, they want to bring back, and we've tried to bring back a little bit more of the physicality. Like, I think people like to see hard defense. I mean, it goes a little bit before to what you and I are talking about, like touch and feel, like yeah. I, I don't think either people like that idea that guys can go through unscathed and like yeah. you're protecting your star players. Yeah. And in fact, you know, we made some changes this season where sort of, I don't know, you know, the, the unnatural basketball gotcha. moves, gotcha. you know what I'm referring yeah. to, and now, where those were being players were gaming the system in a way. Catching and on. they, brilliant players playing yeah. by the rules had found, found ways where those were becoming defensive yeah, fouls. Yeah. So you just heard the NBA commissioner come out there and say, physicality can affect skill players, players like Stephen Curry and others. Now, some, some of you may be saying, but that's not necessarily true. I need an example of this. Fantastic. I'll provide you one. All you need to go is go back, all you need to do is go back to the 2021 NBA playoffs and the Eastern Conference in the first round where you had the number one rated defense in the NBA, the Boston Celtics playing against the one of the best offenses in the NBA in the in the in the in the what is it in the um Brooklyn Nets featuring Kyrie Irving, who some believe is the most skilled player ever, Kevin Durant, arguably the most skilled, arguably, arguably the most 
uh, efficient perimeter player in the history of basketball. These guys go into a series playing against the Boston Celtics with their length, with the athleticism of Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and all of these guys. And essentially what the referees allowed to happen was the referees in that series allowed the Boston Celtics to do what? Play 90s defense, which is essentially physical basketball. And I want to give the credit to Chris Broussard because, because he's the one that brought up this point. And what happened in that series? If these so-called players, these specialists that are so skilled with all of these three-point shooters like uh, uh, Seth Curry and all of them were on that team, uh, uh, I forgot the other guy um, that plays for the that played for them at the time, another three-point specialist. I forgot his name. If these guys are so skilled, why were they absolutely stifled by that Boston Celtic defense? Why were they stifled? What we discovered was. The moment you allow the game to be physical, the moment you allow to touch pop players, crowd their space, get physical with them, move them off their spots, is going to affect the way that they play. And what KD was not used to was that level of, uh, of physicality and a lack of space. And you saw his numbers plummet in that series. So when you inject 90s defense into this cur current era of, NBA, uh, of the NBA, you begin to see players struggle. So what does that make you think Then, when you think about players in the past, in the 2000s, 2010s, that were averaging 28, 29, 30, 30 points per game? What does that say about those players that were actually able to go out there and score those points? Wouldn't one be able to surmise that those guys were actually more skilled and tougher than players today? Now, if you don't believe me, I want to point to another sh to another audio because we like to use evidence to support all of our points of Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant speaking to Floyd Mayweather about the lack of physicality in the NBA during his playing days and how it makes it hard for players to defend players because of the freedom of movement and the lax defensive rules. For those of you who never heard this clip, we want to play for you. It's about a 20 second, 30 second clip. Take a listen to what Kobe had to say here and then we'll come back and give you give you guys our closing thoughts. Take a listen to that there. But listen, over there the rules kind of different. I think when the ball be like on the rim, you can like- You can knock it off. Man. Okay, yeah, that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. you do. That's why, you know what though? They let, they, let, they let you play over there too. Yeah, you got to really get fouled. Okay. Yeah, they let you play. You really gotta get fouled. No, I hear they change the rules up and shit. You can't even touch them. Right. Yeah, don't yeah, touch them. It's crazy. Yeah. You know? So, you still traveling with him? So, you heard what Kobe Bryant had to say. Kobe was a 12 time all defensive player. 12. Kobe's made more defensive teams than LeBron and Kawhi Leonard combined. That's how good Kobe was a, def uh, was a defender. And you heard what Kobe Bryant said. He said, you can't touch them anymore. So anyone with sense that listened to that information will understand that the reason players today score more is because you can't touch them. Notice I didn't say it's because they're better. I said it's because you cannot touch them. Let's go to one of uh, the next point that he brought up. He brought up about he brought up a point about how players played. Uh, I want to point, I want to point something out. He talked about the style, you know, stylistically how guys move and all of this stuff. The question I have to ask, uh, to JX, my high roller and others, if refs actually call traveling and carrying, how many turnovers a game do you think these guys would be having? How dirty would the game look if every other play a player was caught being called for palming the ball. Wouldn't there be a lot of low light reels of look, this guy can't even dribble the ball without carrying it. He lacks the fundamentals. What do you think the NBA game would look like if they actually enforced the rules? A person that pointed this out was Tracy McGrady. Tracy McGrady, who was one of the most skilled offensive players to ever play in the NBA said, there are, there are, they are allowing players to travel. And if you can travel and palm the ball and carry, you can do a lot of things that those guys in the past couldn't do because they were playing within the rules. These guys are not. Why aren't you bringing this point up? You conveniently <clears throat> left that out. Another thing he said was, in terms of why he believes this era is better, was that he said the way players turned over the ball that was higher in the past which means for whatever reason that 
maybe these guys are clumsy or whatever. The question you have to ask yourself, the question beyond, uh, beyond the question of, well, they're better, is why was that the case? Why were players turning the ball over? And he is correct. Players in that era were turning the ball over more than they do today. The question is why? To me, the answer, again, is quite simple and is based off a simple ob observation. When you pressure the ball and there's more resistance to ball handlers, you will get more turnovers. In fact, a steal is literally a turnover. Quite literally. And that's why, on average, teams average more steals per game three decades ago than they do today. He conveniently left that information out because he knew a lot of people would not do the research. He also heard his argument, in my personal view, by saying that players in the past played in much more structured offense, playing it with sets and all of that. The fact of the matter is teams in the past play within systems. And teams today play what Kobe Bryant liked to call accidental basketball. So that wasn't a good point. And I think he actually hurt himself by bringing up that point. I think he actually worked against himself by bringing up that point. Here are the facts. <clears throat> As we currently speak, American players, American born NBA players have fallen behind. These are the facts of the matter. International players are taking over the NBA. The question then becomes, why? Why are they taking over the NBA? Are they more athletic? Are they No, because people make fun of Luka Doncic and all. So why would that be the case? If players of today are more physically, and you also got, you see, we got to use our thinking caps. If guys today are more physical and more imposing and all that, why can't they stop Luka Doncic? Why can't they stop Nikola Jokic? Nikola Jokic can't even jump off the floor, but they can't stop him. So the physicality, excuse me, the athleticism that you point to and all of that, it's not really serving you. The last MVPs to win the, 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 the regular season MVP are all foreigners. Are all foreigners. And guess what? Again, today is going to be a foreigner. This year is going to be a foreigner. It's going to be SGA or Nikola Jokic. Nik uh, 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 SGA is not an American. He is a Canadian. Canadians are not Americans. They even have a different currency. Don't play that game. Now, all of a sudden, they want to claim uh, uh, Joel Embiid. Really? You're going to claim Joel Embiid two years ago? The brother was from Cameroon. All of a sudden today, now he American. Really? You want to claim him when he's useful to you. Listen, the simple reason why these guys are beating these NBA players today is because they work on their fundamentals and they're taught their fundamentals. That's what Kobe Bryant had to say. Who supersedes anybody having this conversation? His views supersede anyone even talking about this conversation. Pure point blank. The fact of the matter is we are actually witnessing a regression. And that's what no one really wants to talk about. Not just a regression in the game, but a regression in the attitude and the mentality of players. No one with a straight face would be saying that these players, that the NBA is actually evolving for the better. It's not. And it's one of the reasons the NBA has recognized that they have some serious issues to solve. Hence the reason they're looking to bring back defense because they know offenses run amok and there's no resistance. So no players today are not more skilled the 90s is a better era by any measurable statistic by viewership by excitement by style of basketball every single thing you want to put it you want to include in it it's better players are shooting threes shooting mid-range playing in the post today just a three-point shootout and layups i'm sorry there's nothing impressive with that with a guy running down the lane with nobody there and the only form of resistance is a six foot ten center Puh. Please.